Hello everyone, my name is Alvaro and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Colorado Boulder. Today I had the pleasure to present a collaboration with our Russian colleagues from the Technical University of Omsk. This paper deals with what we can classify as several high-risk, high-return solutions to ensure the proper restart of a liquid rocket engine after it goes through a microgravity window or microgravity period. The reason why we care about this is that as you know, space debris nowadays is a major concern for the space community and guidelines are being implemented to ensure that launch stages are either deorbited back to Earth or reorbited to a graveyard orbit, right? Uh, so in order to make that happen, we need to restart the engines after they are turned off uh, during the coast phase. So for instance, if you take a look at Falcon 9's flight profile, you will see that that happens in two scenarios. In the first stage, it happens once the second stage is separated. So the, the first stage goes through a rotation maneuver, so through a flip around maneuver. And in this period, um, the propellant is subject to mic the microarray environment and several disturbances that disseminated in the propellant tank. In the case of the second stage, the same happens when the payload is separated. We enter a microarray window, the propellant is uh, atomized. And in order to restart the engines, we have to make sure that no gas gets into the nozzles. Or in other words, we need to make sure that the propellant is settled before we can actually start the main engines. Just to make things a bit clearer, if you take a look at these official videos from Falcon 9 that you can find in YouTube, you will see that once the first stage separates, uh, here it is, uh, once the first stage separates, the propellant automizes and floats around inside the tank. It is better the, the view is better here in this after cycle. You can see this sloshing wave, and then once the stage separates, all the propellant is atomized inside the tank. So what we end up having is this uh, mixture of liquid oxygen and, and propellant in the and, and yes, some fuel in the fuel tank that is floating around. In order to restart the engine, we need to settle these bubbles and these droplets of, of liquid. The question is, how do we do it? For 60 years, our solution has been to employ what we call nowadays ULH engines. ULH engines are a, an auxiliary propulsion unit that is in charge of inducing a small acceleration to the rocket in such a way that all those droplets that you can see in the image settle back to the bottom of the tank. The technical data on these systems is not easily available. It is not accessible. Only, only uh, reports from the Apollo era uh, can be found easily online about this kind of technology. And it is very hard to make a technical assessment of their reliability and their performance. What we know is that they weight more or less, depending on the mission profile, uh, several hundred kilograms. And considering current Falcon 9's launch cost, here we are talking about half a million dollars per launch and stage. So what I mean with this is that this technology, even though it is robust and have, has been tested for a long time, also in, is, is also very heavy. And for that, it accounts for a significant economic penalty in every launch that we have. So there is a strong economic motivation to figure out new ways to set a propellant in orbit. Those new um, technologies have to be subject, however, to several boundary conditions that we can estimate from an official data, like telemetry, an official telemetry, and also from the videos available, made available by SpaceX. So for instance, taking Falcon 9 as a baseline, we know that the first stage takes about two or three minutes to settle. And that is a, a, requis a requisite imposed by the CONOPS. While the second stage takes about six minutes. And that is something that is imposed by the fluid mechanics of this problem. Uh, analyzing again telemetry data from the system, we figure out that the stage separation acceleration is of the order of one meter per second square. And that that acceleration or that separation force is applied for less than one second. So we built a very simple model that is described in our paper and that turns out to have this acceleration profile. Now, usually when you restart an engine, you want all the propellant to be at the bottom of the tank. But that's not strictly necessary because once you start the main engines, the, those main engines also assert settling on the system because they induce an acceleration. So what we have done is computing the bare minimum propellant that we need to start the engines and settle the propellant uh, at the same time. In order to do that, we have tested different thrust configurations. Our equations were very clear in this. 
the lower the thrust we can produce with the main engines, the better in terms of mass requirements. And the best condition that we found was the single engine configuration, where we only require 300 kilograms of liquid oxygen at the first stage or 700 at the second. Those are the bare minimum masses of the uh, oxidizer that we need to restart the engine in a safe way. Again, considering that that operation of the single engine also settles the rest of the propeller. Let's go now to the high risk, high return technical solutions. The first one of them is magnetic positive position. The magnetic positive positioning concept was invented by Solomon Steve Paper in 1965, and it basically consists on using magnets to settle a liquid in microgravity in such a way that the liquid is attached to the magnet. In the same patent, by the way, PayPal invented also ferrofluids precisely for this application. The idea was forgotten for many years and then it was recovered in the 2000s by uh, Marcetta and co-workers who studied this same concept with liquid oxygen. This, the use of magnetic forces in cryogenic propellants is very interesting, but we, and, the, and I mean, this is a, an example that we have here, right? Uh, but nobody has ever studied the technical feasibility of this approach in a launch stage configuration. So the first approach that we explore is the brute force one, which is uh, basically consists on holding the propellant against disturbing accelerations using magnetic forces. So I need you to follow me with this. We have computed that the um, stage separation acceleration is of the order of one meter per second squared. And we need at least 70 kilograms of liquid oxygen for the second stage. That's the bare minimum in all cases. That means that we need to hold a sphere of liquid oxygen of more or less 25 centimeters radius. If we take a one ampere turn coil uh, and simulate the acceleration that this coil asserts on liquid oxygen, we get this plot. In this plot, in the color map, you see the logarithm of the acceleration. And you can see how at about 25 centimeters, which is what we need for the second stage in the best possible scenario, the acceleration of this one ampere turn coil is of the order of 10 to the minus 11 meters per second square. Now, this acceleration scales with the square of the current intensity, which means that we need at least 1 million amperes turn to hold the liquid against 1 meter per second square. Well, my friends, good luck with that. That is an absurd, uh, absurd and, a, and a, a brutal value for any kind of magnetic technology that we use nowadays. This is huge. Uh, in, and just to give you an idea, it's like if you had a single loop of current with a hundred amperes, sorry, with a million amperes flowing through it. Not even superconductors can reach this value nowadays. So this is discarded. The second approach is, uh, you know, follows the basic principle. If you can beat them, beat them, join them, right? So uh, the idea is that, okay, we will let the propellant fly inside the tank. But then once it is flying up there, we collect it back using a magnetic force. And this is what we tested here in a drop tower experiment at SARM in Bremen. You can see how we generate this, uh, we have this ferrofluid and a magnetic coil. They enter a microwave window now, and now a bubble is generated, sorry, a droplet is generated here. The droplet is magnetic, so it feels attracted towards the magnet. But note how some residual remains at the top of the time. That is the big problem with this approach. Fluid structure interactions are very strong and the magnetic force cannot be them at mid distances. So we rely on a weak fluid structure interaction to meet this work. Now, take a look at this plot. What I am representing in this plot is the time of flight of this droplet from that given distance to the bottom of the tank. And I'm representing it for different magnets, for different ampere turn magnets from 100 to a million ampere turns. I also plot, superpose to, this, to these curves, the maximum time that we have. So the intersection between the maximum time and the time of flight curves give us how much distance can we settle before the end of the flight. And on top of that, we plot the mass that we need from, our, from, from the first and the second states, assuming that all the droplets are di distributed uniformly in the system. So what we get here is that we need at least a thousand ampere turns to collect back the droplets in the second stage and 100,000 for the second stage, which is good. It means that we have reduced the requirements of our system by one to three orders of magnitude. And by requirements, I mean the magnetic requirements of the system. The third approach is probably my favorite. It consists on, on a very simple idea. If we had to prevent the um, detached acceleration to you know, unsettle the liquid and generate all this cloud of droplets, why don't we store the liquid in separate tanks? 
and we release the liquid to a magnet that holds them in place in a microgravity environment after uh, we we separate the stage. And there are a thousand configurations that we can you can test there. I will just cover the, my favorite one, which is a single internal tank just above the fuel outlet. The basic idea of this approach is to have an oxygen tank with an open bottom end. And the idea is that once you enter the microgravity window and all the propellant has, has fly uh, outside in the form of droplets, you can open this air valve in here. And by doing so, you let all the liquid oxygen flow back to the bottom of the, of the, of the tank by the, uh, under the action of the magnetic force. And the mass of this is of the order of 20 kilograms considering the tank and the magnet. So it is extremely mass efficient for both stages. You can see here that uh, just a 5.5 kilogram magnet can hold the liquid against these turbine accelerations uh, of to 10 to, the minus 10 to the minus 4 meters per second square, which means that this system will be able to hold the liquid against the microgravity environment of the launch stage. The mass and power, and I will go about this very briefly, uh, the mass and power budgets look as follows. Uh, we tested aluminum coils, which are more mass efficient than um, copper coils, and presidimium magnets. Presidimium is, a kind of, is kind of similar to neodymium, but it works better for cryogenic temperatures, like those of liquid oxygen. What you can see is that the presidimium magnet beats the aluminum coil in all cases in terms of mass. It's more mass efficient, and it can generate, you know, 52 kilograms is a lot, but it is not a lot if we compare it with existing systems. And with that, we can generate up to 100,000 amperes turns of, of effective current, right? So with this approach, we can actually, uh, in a, with a re reasonable mass, we can actually uh, make the system work. Uh, no wonder why we cannot make the passive retention statically work. As you can see, 10 to the 6 amperes turns uh, ha requires Half a, ton, a half a ton magnet to work, and that is just not going to happen. Um, high temperature superconductors are not yet ready to work at 90K. And in case you are wondering what happens with a fuel tank, in the fuel tank, uh, the kerosene is a diamond material, but if we add a small ferromagnetic nanoparticles with a very small concentration of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.001 volume concentration, sorry, uh, you, can make, you can get the same magnetic response as with liquid oxygen. However, further analysis are required to actually figure out if these approaches are, are feasible, technically feasible. The second approach that we cover in this paper is the propellant gasification system. And this is the, the great contribution from our Russian colleagues who invented this approach. So what they um, plan to do is to use a hydrogen peroxide tank, auxiliary tank on top of the liquid oxygen tank and a catalyzer system, a catalytic system, sorry. So the idea of this is that you can turn on this system and uh, generate a plume of hot gas at 800 Kelvin. This hot gas transfer heat to the liquid oxygen that vaporizes. And by doing so, you increase the pressure of the liquid oxygen tank in such a way that you can use the, the vaporized gas residuals to feed some gas jet nozzles that provide attitude control and settling capabilities. The conops of the mission are detailed here. We are first doing a flip around maneuver uh, as done by Falcon 9. And then we provide the conditions for engine restart. How does this look in terms of thermodynamic analysis? And there is a lot of, of material in our paper to describe this that I just don't cover because we don't have time for it. It looks like follows. First of all, we increase the pressure to four atmospheres and we use a combination of the hydrogen peroxide tank and the helium tank that we use for pressurizing the system to balance, you know, to balance the pressure and control the presence of the system. And by using that combination, the system turns out to be much more efficient we increase the tank gas temperature to 280 Kelvin, which is considered, still considered as, as a safe temperature limit. And we use a one kilonewton uh, for turning and five kilonewton for settling. Again, the math and further technical details are available in the paper. It, this turns out to have a mass of more or less 100 kilograms of passive weight. Um, the flow rates, as I said, of helium and hydrogen peroxide are not optimized. And if we optimize them, and we will do in, in a future version of this work, we can see potential enhance, enhancements in terms of mass budget. And also you should know that this analysis of the second stage is not presented, but it's underway. In case you are wondering, there is no risk of explosion. And there is no risk of explosion because we are injecting a hot mixture of water and oxygen to an oxygen tank. So there is no fuel to start an explosion in that scenario, even if it is a, an 800 uh, Kelvin gas mixture. The final approach that we explore in our papers is the hybrid magnetic acidification. 
the basic idea is that, okay, so most of the mass comes uh, for the PGS comes from the engine restart um, phase of the conops, right? So what if we remove this and substitute that by a, by a magnetic system? So what we do is, uh, in the, this is the same plot as before, but we have plotted here the, uh, the different curves of the time of flight as a function of the initial velocities of the droplets. And you can see that if we can actually assert an, an initial velocity of five millimeters per second, we can ensure that uh, all the system is all the mass requirements of the different approaches for the first and second stage are going to be satisfied. So uh, the certain maneuver that we need is of the order of one second, last one second more or less, and that starts a droplet moving of 10 millimeters per second. We use a five kilogram magnet to hold the liquid at the bottom of the tank. And with this approach, we estimate preliminary that we can reduce the mass requirements of the system in 60, in 60 kilograms. That means that we can save more than 150K per launch and state. In conclusion, uh, the passive magnetic retention strategy is the only one that has been explored in the past, and it is the only one that is completely unfeasible from this preliminary analysis. However, the other two strategies that we have presented, the magnetic recovery and active magnetic retention, reduce significantly the mass requirements of the system, particularly for the second stage. We are talking here about one to two orders of magnitude mass reduction. So more or less a, a million dollar mass savings per, per launch, which is significant. The propellant gasification system leads to a smaller mass reduction, but is much more robust. It is still sensitive to liquid movement because the, the heat transfer of the system is modified depending on the, on the liquid oxygen interface configuration. Still, uh, it is very promising because we, um, at least the theory is neat. I mean, uh, everything should work, but we need to make experiments to find the optimum configuration for the nozzles. And the hybrid magnetic classification is a combination of both approaches that reduces the mass requirements and hopefully, and I say hopefully because we need to run more simulations and experiments, leads to reduce mass requirements of below 100 kilograms for the first stage and even less for the second. We will see that in a future paper. In conclusion, uh, magnetic positive, positive positioning approaches uh, apparently lead to very significant mass reductions, but we need to assess the robustness of this method with advanced uh, simulation and experimental methods. Propellant gasification systems offer an enhanced robustness and lower mass reductions, and a combination of them seems very interesting because it combines the, the best of both worlds. Uh, in any case, there seems to be, from our preliminary study, uh, there seems to be a strong economical motivation to persevere in the study of these concepts. And that's what we are going to do in the coming months. Well, that was the end of it. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And please, if you have any questions, concerns, if you want to collaborate with us or anything else, just please reach out to these links and these profiles, read our paper, come back to us, and we will be more than happy to share all the technical details and collaborate with you in the best possible extent. Again, thanks for watching this presentation.